Uh, thank you for coming to this session in our election prep webinar series. Um, we decided today to really zero in on something we talk about a lot, but often not as explicitly as other topics within the Trusting News universe. And it has to do squarely with understanding who is in our audience and how they view the work that we're doing. So it's a concept we call bring your receipts. And it is explaining things in your reporting that uh, might feel obvious to journalists, but if we are not explicit enough about them, it can make people feel like our work is not approachable or understandable. So if you're new to Trusting News, uh, since 2016, we have been learning all we can about how people decide what news to trust and running training and coaching programs for journalists about demonstrating credibility and earning trust. We see ourselves as standing in the gap of trust between journalists and the communities they serve, um, helping build mutual understanding. I'm Joy Mayer. I am the Executive Director of Trusting News, and I am joining you from Sarasota, Florida. Hi, everyone. Lynn Walsh, the Assistant Director of Trusting News, joining from upstate New York. So we're asking this basic question over this chapter um, and then approaching it from a bunch of different angles. What does the public think about how well journalists are doing with election coverage? Um, so some of you have been with us for other webinars and uh, you've seen us answer that question from a variety of, of perspectives. Um, today, we're specifically gonna talk about specific perceptions of news, what people think about the news and why some things that we present as facts in our journalism feel like opinion to some people, and how understanding that um, can help us respond to them in ways that build the credibility of our work. Um, we'll talk about that philosophically, and then we'll talk about what that can look like across some specific topics that a lot of us are covering. And then we'll talk about what it looks like to sort of shine a light on the process, kind of how we know what we know. So we know for sure that some people, based on a lot of a lot of factors of identity and ideology are more inclined to trust the news and give us the benefit of the doubt. And other people are inclined to be very skeptical of what we do and not give us the benefit of the doubt. That often corresponds to whether people see their own realities and values reflected in the news. If they feel like the news is made for and by people like them, if they feel like the news understands and respects the viewpoint that they have, they're more inclined to see us as one of them sort of to, to trust what we say. So the more we understand that, the better we can respond to it. Showing that our work is fair and accurate sometimes relies on our understanding of what people are looking for as signs of fair and accurate. So what it will take for our audience to perceive us as fair and accurate is a key part of the equation. So Lynn is going to walk us through some um, frameworks of how we, how we approach that. Yeah, and at Trusting News, we like to look at research that's been done by organizations like Gallup, like Pew, like Knight, um, Ipsos, Reuters. Um, there are lots of different organizations, you know, doing research about trust. And so we like to look at what they are learning and build off of that by um, building solutions, basically, around those problems that they are seeing and trends they are seeing. And so Joy talked about, you know, depending on who someone might be and what their beliefs are. Well, one big um, difference in trust that has been that that you can look at and and it has been trending sort of in this direction is what how someone identifies politically. So for several years, people who identify as Republicans or conservatives, their distrust in news has been much higher than Democrats. Um, what's interesting is in recent years, independents, as you can see on this chart, also um, the level of distrust there is it's almost equal. It's very, very close. Um, and so as we think about this problem and why I think this is important for journalists to think about is I think sometimes in newsrooms, they think this distrust just comes from, oh, it's Republicans that don't trust us. It's the right. It's conservatives that don't trust us. Well, it's actually not true. There's people on all ends of the aisle. Yes, more Republicans. If Republicans are more likely, according to data and research, but independents also are um, like more likely to distrust in the content. So we should be keeping that in mind. And why we should be keeping that in mind is because, you know, people often think if they already distrust or they have a political viewpoint, they are going to think that the way that we highlight or cover that issue is because we are trying to further our agenda 
And a lot of times, if you are covering a candidate they like in a bad light, or it's a negative story that, or a story they perceive to be negative or saying they are losing, um, they are going to think that you want their candidate to lose or you are for the other candidate. Um, the other thing that happens a lot, and this is especially true with political content, is that often when we are writing things as journalists, we may treat certain things as facts that may actually be a fact, but we haven't maybe explained or as this webinar is like given the receipts to back up the fact that it is a fact and instead we say it, move on. Well, there are some people who see that as more of an opinion. The um, election being stolen or not stolen is one of those things. And I know Joy is going to cover some of that, but that's something that we kind of just will maybe say it wasn't stolen, which it wasn't. But to some people who believe that, they will see that as an opinion. And it's if people hold very tightly to the idea that that's not true, um, that can be harder to convince them. But then there are others that just genuinely aren't sure what to believe because being a news consumer is frustrating and it's difficult and it's confusing. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that most people have a very casual relationship with the news. This makes finding information difficult. They're not sure how, who to trust, um, what content to trust. One reason is if they are a casual news consumer, that means they're probably getting news kind of very haphazardly. Maybe they're seeing a headline that when they open up Google, maybe they're seeing something on Yahoo, maybe they're seeing something on Facebook, or they're just hearing things from people they know. And when you are just kind of casually getting information, and you really don't have maybe the interest or the time to fact check or dig deeper, then it can be hard to differentiate what's true, what's not. And then you may also be, be more likely to just trust what your friend is saying because you trust them, right? And so why would they tell you something that's not true? And so, yes, when we talk about trying to talk to people who may say that something that is a fact isn't true and how do we explain this? There are some people that might be harder to convince, but there are a lot of people that just may not know because they're not exposing themselves um, to content like we are. And so the question we like to at Trusting News, you know, we, we there is sort of all of this negative um, data potentially that could be depressing. We don't like to focus on that. It's good to know, but we like to focus on solutions. And so if you are all here, we know you're a responsible, ethical, mission-driven journalist. So the question is, what should you do? And at Trusting News, we do believe there are solutions. And we want to just kind of say, you know, this does not mean that you are giving credence to misinformation. Absolutely not. We are not saying that. If something is not true, you need to say it's not true. Um, we should not soften reporting of facts. And we also should not pander to people who believe conspiracy theories. But we can do a better job of meeting people where they are. And so that's with if someone does believe in a conspiracy theory, asking better questions, which we will talk a little bit about. And we have other resources, too. But, you know, talking to them, where did that belief come from? Is there something else that you can explain that would help kind of get them off of believing that conspiracy theory? Um, explaining how we know what we know, transparency, we're going to talk a lot about today. And um, working to make coverage hearable by people across viewpoints. And so that does not mean pandering to people, but it does mean thinking more carefully about the coverage that we're producing and producing it in a way that is for our whole audience, which we will talk about. Um, and so just a little bit more about what we do at Trusting News. We've been working with newsrooms and researchers in this cycle of learning. And like I said, we really do see this as, as our role of either doing our own research or using research that's out there, coming up with potential solutions, testing those solutions with newsrooms. That's something that's really important to us. Like, is this feasible and doable within a newsroom? We then test, did that work? If it did work to build trust or it helped improve relationships, we share that. And then we kind of keep building on that. Um, most of the work that we do with newsrooms does fit into about three main categories, working on transparency, engagement and listening, and then within those two things, it's being having humility um, about how you are approaching your audiences, when you approach your audiences, understanding your audiences, and how you are responding. And when you are responding with humility, 
you are kind of articulating like this counter narrative. You are not getting angry or upset. Your tone is really important. Um, and so we focus on that transparency, that engagement and listening. With all of that, having humility, meeting people where they are, understanding um, who they are and what they believe in, um, what their experiences have been. When we're sharing that transparency language, having that counter narrative, and most importantly, making it findable, which means taking advantage of that attention when we have it. It's great to have an ethics page. It's great to have a mission and goals page. If you're not sharing that regularly, most people are connecting it to daily stories. Most people probably aren't going to find it. And so we do truly believe that if we can, as journalists, invest in understanding how our work might be perceived, we can provide a better public service to a wider audience. And I think all of you would agree, I hope that what you are doing is a public service. People have a right to inf information, especially here in the U.S. We are serving them that information and providing that service for them to get that information. They don't have time to do it on their own. It is a very, it's a great public service, but people don't necessarily see it that way. So we need to tell them about it. And I love this point because we serve the public that we have, not the public we wish we had. And so often one of the first questions when, if a newsroom approaches, uh, approaches me and says like, how could I build trust with this particular group? you know, or how could I build trust in this area about political coverage? I say, who are you hoping to reach? Are you hoping to reach your whole audience? Or are you just trying to reach a segment? Because how you move forward definitely would vary. And I, the recommendations that I would make would, would vary. And so in this, um, in these situations, we're going to talk about how you're serving the public that you have, which for a lot of you, if you're working for local newspaper, local TV station, regional news organizations, websites, it is a very broad and diverse group of people, and we need to keep that in mind as we are um, producing our content. It also means that we need to work to understand where people are coming from so we can provide more effective on-ramps to that information and help them become familiar with the content um, before they see it and just are like, I know nothing about that. So why am I even going to click on that story? And so if we're thinking about that general audience that we have, and we want to reach that general audience, providing effective on-ramps to information that might be new to them is really, really important. Um, and the same goes with ideas that might not be familiar with them. Sometimes that means stepping back, explaining why you're using certain terms, explaining why you're covering this in the first place. Like, why does it matter to them? Making that connection to them. Um, and using daily stories to kind of paint that bigger picture. So let's talk through some sample topics and look at what this can look like. I'm just going to start with the big one because all of us cover this and all of us have had interactions in our personal lives, frankly, with, um, and we're wondering how is it that people um, have so much disagreement about this um, and how are, how do we make this basic fact that the 2020 election was fairly won, that there was not evidence of fraud um, that would have changed the outcome. Um, how do we help people accept that? So to reiterate something Lynn said, there are people who hold so tightly to the view that um, former President Trump is correct on this and that he actually won that election. And we are not at all saying that everybody is persuadable. We are saying that in the networks of the people who hold very tightly to that idea, are a lot of people who might think that that's true because that's what everybody around them is saying, um, but isn't couldn't you know cite the court cases and, and is not ready to back up and kind of fight for the veracity of their um, their take on it. A lot of people aren't sure what to believe, but a lot of those people still would say that they think the election was not fairly won. So um, this early this year, more than a third of Americans more people than did in 2021 still said they thought the election was stolen. So let's look at what it can look like um, to address that. It is so interesting to me. I've started to really notice how often stories include language like baseless claims of election fraud and do not link to any evidence. That is the very basics of this concept of bringing your receipts. How do you know? What are the facts? If you include this claim, 
if you include this phrase in your story, you are basically assuming that everyone agrees with you. So that might be true for the audience you reach, for the community you serve. If it is not, and you don't give an on-ramp to that phrase, then you are sending a signal that you don't need to back it up. And you're sending a signal that anybody who doesn't agree with it is not who you're trying to reach, which is sort of seeding them to news sources that will confirm their view on the world. So um, we, are tr we are working to make the facts findable and understandable. Whether people believe them is up to them, but we can understand them well enough to, for to bring the links and make them accessible. Um, not just buried inside daily stories. So when we have covered the, the result of a court case, uh, a lawsuit in our state back in the day, and we're like, well, that's done. The evidence is in. But man, if you go look for it, it's really hard to find. So how do we, um, I think of this sometimes as sort of bringing a Wikipedia page for the result of something. Where, where are we sort of collecting what is known? So um, step one would be to link to some fact checks. So there are a lot of them out there. Um, you know, here's a claim that um, Trump made earlier this year and PolitiFact delivers, of course, with a um, fact check saying that it's false. And if you click through, um, there are links to polls and research. So numerous reviews say this, more than 60 lawsuits say this. Um, a group of conservatives, including former federal judges, examined every fraud and miscount claim and concluded that they failed to present enough evidence to invalidate the results. That report also links to, a, that story fact check also links to a really long report. Um, so that is a great start. I would love to see it not as part of a daily story in response to something um, like one statement made, but like a story that just says, here's what is known. I would love to see that state by state, which is something um, the AP has done. Here's what, here's what was found in Arizona. Here's what was found in Georgia. Um, that is super useful. And it links to evidence. That piece isn't tied to a specific news hook, which is great because then it can be a more long lasting resource. They have kind of a general headline. Claims are still being made. Here are the facts. So step one would be to find something like this and make a habit of linking to it. It doesn't have to be your coverage. Um, Publish APs if you want, but just link somewhere. I would love it if there were a deeper dive into each state where there were really um, claims. If you follow, if you cover a specific geographic location, I hope there's a version that covers just the part that your um, that's kind of your purview. So let's look at some examples of how specific newsrooms that we've worked with have addressed this. Um, the staff of the Chattanooga Times Free Press realized soon after um, 2020 that. Uh, there, I believe they said that 82% of their coverage area had voted for Trump and that if they did not make election coverage hearable by that 82%, that they were basically going to lose a whole lot of audience and seed that audience to further write less responsible news sources. So what they did was create boilerplate language to actually add into AP stories. They weren't covering a lot of election fraud stories. They're a local Chattanooga-based newsroom. But they're in the corner of Chattanooga that was also like covers Georgia and Marjorie Taylor Greene territory. And they, you know, they were running a lot of their coverage area included Georgia and they were running a lot of stories about election fraud. So they decided that with those stories, if they knew that they're, if they saw something they knew their audience would think was opinion, they were going to add something in. So um, here's an example of what that looked like. An original version of an AP story says, um, Republican support for this lawsuit and its call to throw out millions of vote was rooted in baseless claims of fraud, an extraordinary display of the party's willingness to countermand the will of the voters. They said that is not going to fly with our community. That feels like it should be an opinion column. So here's what they said. They added in the part in bold. No evidence has been found to support the president's claims and several judges in multiple states have dismissed lawsuits by his legal team that alleged voting improprieties. Election security efforts also said there's no evidence of computer fraud. Trump later fired him for that statement. Attorney General said the Justice Department did not uncover evidence of widespread voter fraud. So it's a lot to get through. Um, ideally, that would also have links to where people could dig deeper if they want to. But their staff 
kept, I think, a couple versions of graphs like this on hand and just added them into um, relevant stories. Another way to do that is to include it in how you talk about your election coverage overall. Um, WITF in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is a newsroom we've worked with a lot. And um, we helped with their election FAQ where they cover a whole lot of factors of why they um, kind of what their goal is with election coverage, who they're trying to reach, what they how they choose to cover what they cover, their relationship to NPR and the coverage that they were going to get um, kind of from DC and around the country versus what was produced locally. It's a really great thorough FAQ. As part of that, they talked about why they feel comfortable using the phrase election fraud by, which is, you know, would be unusual in most cases, but they really wanted to explain why they felt comfortable doing it. So they say, we don't use the word lie lightly. We've examined the facts, including those in news reports, court documents, decisions, and testimony. Um, based on evidence, we see an organized strategy with identifiable actors and actions as part of this attempt to stay in power. So then the second paragraph links to voter data, um, federal agencies and court cases, statistical claims, comprehensive fact check. So the evidence is there if people want it. To Lynn's point, People don't click on your about page very often or your election FAQ. So if you do this kind of thing and it's not included in the text of a story, it's just crucial to continually link back to it. So if you have, if you can link directly to this, that's what I would do whenever you have a story that says baseless claims of election fraud or concerns about election security. Um, send people here every time so they don't have to hunt for it. If they're like, really? Are you saying that? Because people in my world would not agree. Then you're bringing the receipts. Another third way that newsrooms have done this, um, if you've come to our webinars before in this election series, you might have heard us talk about the newsletter Tangle. Um, I'm just a huge fan of Tangle and the work that journalist Isaac Saul has done building that. Um, check it out if you haven't. They just hit a million subscribers, I think. Um, they do really great work um, with a specific goal of trying to be hearable across the political spectrum and do reporting and analysis that would feel fair and accessible to people regardless of their views. So in a recent, um, I was emailing with the founder of Tangle, Isaac Saul, and asked this question. And he said, hey, that actually came up in our reader mailbag edition yesterday. So just last week, I think that he did like a reader Q&A. And a reader said, how much can we depend on election integrity this year? So his response is going to look a little different because he writes in the first person. It comes from him, the executive editor. And he says, you can depend on it. Um, as someone on the front lines of reporting election fraud claims, I want to be as clear as I can. Um, there is four years later, there's still been no legitimate evidence um, of any widespread fraud. Remember, this was disproven and this was a lie and this was also bunk and this was never proven. So it's all there. And remember also that whether people click through on these links, the fact that you are willing to back it up has power. So if you say something that's not a link, it feels like you think it doesn't need to be backed up. If you say something and it's a hyperlink, even if your analytics data doesn't show that people click through on these links, there is a perception benefit in showing that you have evidence. Um, Isaac wrote, went on to write, here's what happened in Arizona and people are profiting financially from this claim. There's like, you know, here's kind of the mechanism that's behind these efforts. And then he says, I'm genuinely open-minded on this issue. Election fraud and voter fraud do happen when people make claims and investigate them. But at this point, I'm just annoyed. I've written about this so many times, I'm not even sure what to say. So effective steps to take. Find a summary of national evidence that you find useful or somewhere else in your state, something your specific audience would feel is approachable and useful in the AP, from PolitiFact, et cetera. Um, and then link to that. That would be the great first step. Just start linking to it. Second is to create a landing page on your site that sums up evidence related to your coverage area. So here were the three main claims about election fraud in Arizona or in Pennsylvania, and here's what happened. It is so hard to track all of this. What were the lawsuits? Um, you know, I know there were a bunch of a bunch of complaints. What were the complaints, and what was the path each one of them took, and what was the verdict for each one? I bet if this is an issue for your state that it's actually kind of hard to find that. Easy to find daily stories about when each thing was resolved. Hard to find it in one place. That's kind of what I mean by the Wikipedia approach. So create that timeless landing page. Either way, whether you're linking to your own coverage or somebody else's, 
every single time your coverage references the integrity of the 2020 election, or even if it's in a quote, even if somebody else is saying it, say, hey, by the way, we actually have an answer to that. Say it on air. If you do broadcast, say it in newsletters, um, link back. Even better than a link is to actually add in language, a parenthetical, a sentence, even a clause can really be helpful because most people won't follow the link. So you can, in a story, say something like, in this video, President, former President Donald Trump referenced baseless claims about this. In fact, no evidence of voter fraud or election fraud has been found. Read how that has been investigated here. And that's where you take people to the receipts. But don't just say, go here to learn more about this. Say, no evidence was found. Here are the receipts. Okay, so let's talk about some other topics where bringing the receipts might be especially useful. Um, let's talk about climate change. It has been, I can remember the days where journalists felt the need to equivocate about climate. That when you quoted somebody about climate science, you had to quote, quote somebody who um, you know, denied that science. Thankfully, we are long past those days, and it is clear that the overwhelming majority of scientists agree that climate change is happening and is largely driven by human activity. I had somebody in my own life ask me recently, how do we know that humans are causing things to change faster than they would be otherwise? And um, it was very interesting trying to hunt for an answer because some people will agree that the climate is warming, but think that the human role is exaggerated. It's really important to remember that it's a spectrum. This is not people who believe science, people who don't believe science. There are lots of people who will see evidence and say, oh yeah, that, that makes sense to me. But are we sure about this part? Are we sure it's not exaggerated? Are we sure there are things that, that, that we could take all, this, all, this, all these actions to try to turn things around and that would actually make a difference? People have a wide range of um, amounts of skepticism and amounts of um, acceptance of things like climate science. So when I went to look for evidence to share with this person who asked me, how do we know that humans are causing the climate to warm? I can't even tell you how many pieces of journalism I found that said human caused climate change without any sort of backing it up. So if we see that, to some people to be like, ah, is that true? And that that's an off ramp, man. If you're reading a story and you think, I don't know if that's true, and they're not telling me how they know it's true, that's an off-ramp. Instead, we want on-ramps. For people who are like, how do we know that's true? A link is an on-ramp. It's an invitation to learn more. So I actually had been messaging with um, a climate funder <laughs> and uh, someone who funds climate science research and also some journalism in climate. And so when I said, hey, by the way, someone just asked me this question, what would you say? He said, oh, let me bring in my uh, someone on my research team. No problem, here's the link. And what I got was this just long roundup of research. So not accessible. I'm better than most at reading research. Not accessible to me. Certainly not accessible to the person I was talking to who was skeptical of it. So how can we synthesize it? So interestingly enough, ChatGPT does a really good job, uh, a decent job. So when I said, how do we know humans are causing the climate to warm, broke it down into some key um, elements of that. Here's how, we, here's what we know about these different factors of how we measure changes in the climate. So I thought that was interesting. I'm a big fan of the Washington Post new climate bot that just launched this summer. Um, they have, it was interesting to see what happens when a chat bot is applied to a body of work, like a decade of Washington Post reporting on climate, because the data is actually pretty stable. A lot of what they have in their climate archive is information that isn't changing a lot or that can be um, adapted for um, AI responses. So this one's, you know, a pretty good summary turned into a paragraph um, as evidenced by the increasing concentration of carbon dioxide, which is higher than it's been in 3 million years, mostly to the burning of fossil fuels. Like it is written in a way that I think um, people could explain. So I wonder how you would answer that question. If the climate is something you cover um, in a way that would kind of look at data, if you would um, have something in your own archive to link to, or if you have the, or if you have uh, consume journalism that helped you understand it that you think would be worth linking to. The main question is, 
the main skill we're trying to build is recognizing what phrase might need to be backed up. So if we're if you are typing human caused climate change, um, we're trying to introduce a red flag going off that would say, do we know for sure? Is everyone gonna accept that? How do we know? So uh, another topic that this comes up, um, it's so fascinating to me to hear how different people feel about how the economy is doing. And that basic question, how is the US economy doing? And you know, you'll hear in reporting, the economy has never been stronger, right? And then you hear over here people saying the economy is my top issue because I my family, my life is unaffordable and that's not getting any better. Um, so obviously there are a lot of indicators for something like measuring the economy and where you rank those indicators are likely going to have an impact on how you feel the economy is doing. Is it the deficit? Is it unemployment? Is it inflation? So it is genuinely confusing and very hard for people to keep up. So I get really excited when I see reporting like the New York Times does a good job of, you know, from time to time offering kind of in the moment literacy. Here's how it's doing. We're going to look at specifically at jobs, income, consumers, production, what's getting bad, what's getting worse. Um, the daily podcast from time to time will have this like, let's just stop and look at eight economic factors and what they tell us about the state of things. So that's really good for in the moment, moment in time literacy. But what if that could be a landing page with data that's routinely updated? What if there were a page that said, we have agreed that these nine factors are most important in looking at how the economy is doing. And maybe this exists. I, I hope if you've seen this, you'll share it. for any of this. If you've seen great examples, um, please send them to us. We'd love to see them. But I would love something that says, when people say the economy is doing well, here's what they mean. And here's how that's changed month over month, year over year. So. I think we could brainstorm a lot of topics of um, that would benefit a lot from this sort of bringing your receipts approach. Things like vaccine safety, things like the evidence that systemic racism is real, um, evolving science and norms around gender, the teaching of critical race theory. I have been raising students uh, with a very conservative school board in Sarasota, Florida. And um, I can't tell you how often I have wished that local journalism would say, I wish there were a page that said, is critical race theory being taught in this school district with something that says, here's what it actually is. And here's what we have learned through local reporting. So I invite your um, thoughts and contributions about what else would be worthwhile to take this approach with. And so as Joy said, you know, what she just was walking through is kind of that that finished product, right? So this, we've now used a word or we are going to use a word or a phrase in our reporting, um, a fact, should we be kind of linking to content um, to back that up? And the answer we believe is yes, for all those reasons we discussed. But there's also a way for us to do this with our process and kind of how we do our journalism. So one potential way is to produce fact checks. But something that we should know if you're producing fact checks is that a lot there's been a lot of research on you know whether or not people believe fact checks or not and what makes it more likely that someone is going to believe it or not. Well, in order for people to believe a fact check, people do have to believe or at least have a good um, thought or kind of think highly of the organization or the journalist providing the right? That definitely helps. Just saying you fact check something does not give you automatic trust. And I think that's important for journalists to keep in mind. The other thing is that researchers have found that fact checks effectiveness is really based on a lot of things out of journalist control, which I know that's not great to hear because you're like, oh, great. So what can I do? Um, but I think it's worth understanding that there is a lot about this that you potentially don't have control of. Um, and that's because whether or not we the effectiveness of a fact check depends upon what we know about an issue already before encountering the fact check and whether you are willing to admit if if you don't know that much whether the story you know whether you're right or wrong and then um if the if it's clearly labeled as a fact check. so there are things out of your control but there are things you can do to help with this one is that you can talk about how you make decisions in your integrity and process. So how do you, in this fact check, like how are you working to make sure that it is accurate? How are you working to make sure you're being fair? How are you working to make sure you're 
um, not putting any bias into it or not furthering any kind of agenda, right? These are things that we do as journalists. People don't know we do it. But if we can explain that, again, it gets that kind of that first point of if people know that you are trustworthy as an organization, they're probably more likely to potentially agree with that fact check. Um, an organization that does this really well is PolitiFact. Obviously, they specialize in fact checking, right? But there are things that they do that you absolutely can duplicate, especially if you are fact checking local politicians, um, national politicians, statewide politicians this election season. One thing that they do particularly well is link to sourcing. This is something all of us can do, and we probably don't do enough. Um, one thing they have done is they've written about their on-the-record sourcing for their fact checks. They also publish a list of sources with every fact check. Um, they also talk about how they contact or attempt to contact the person, website, or organization that made the statement. People do not assume that we do that. That is a basic thing that we all are doing. Let's say that. Um, they also talk about, and I love this, this last paragraph here, that um, here's like what a general process looks like when we do a fact check. And again, it may not always go this way. And sometimes I think we're afraid to get on the record because, oh, it didn't go exactly this way. And if we say it, that it always goes this way. Well, don't use the term always. You can say generally, here's how it works. We review, uh, it starts with a review, you know, of what other fact checkers have found previously, a thorough Google search, even they are using Google, right? Like this seems so relatable. A search of online databases, consultation with a variety of experts, a review of publications, and then a final overall review of available evidence. It's written in plain language. If someone who's not a journalist read that, they can see what that process is like and even try to maybe duplicate it if they want, which you hear people say all the time, I'm going to do my own research, right? Well, now they kind of have a way that they could if they want to. Um, they go on to talk about that how they prioritize and emphasize primary sources, original documentation. I think this is really important too. People do not understand where we get our information. They assume, and I've heard people make an assumption that, oh, someone on, you know, then Twitter was what uh, it was when someone was telling me this with an anonymous source. They just tweet to you. They send you a, a DM and you just publish what they tell you. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, no, actually, that's not how it works. We use academic studies. We go try to find the data. Um, in cases, you know, you, citing news reports from other media, they're fact checking that, especially if there is unattributed sources, right? And so these are things with specifically with sourcing that you can explain, even if you are, depending on whatever story you're working on, but especially when it comes to fact checking. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution did a really good job. They built out a page about their mayoral coverage, how they were going to cover a big mayoral race a couple of years ago. One of the elements on the page was where we get our information. I love this because again, people do not know. And so you're telling them, we're looking at campaign finance reports. And what are those? Well, each candidate has to file these. So that's what those are. That's where we're looking, why we're looking. Other public records, public statements, they are going to attend forums and debates. They are going to have a poll and then also conversations with voters. And I just think it's really helpful because it does pull back that curtain that exists a lot of times because people do not understand it. This is another example that has nothing to do with politics, but is a really good example of talking about, like, how did you come up with this conclusion? Um, and what they this is science news. And they talked about why they were doing this story, which I think is really important because it kind of just this is human element. Um, the reporter talks about how they um, have a husband who's allergic to cats. So, like, this is what kind of caught uh, the person's eye. But they include in this box on the side. Who did we speak to? Well, since the research is sponsored by a company with financial stake, which happens often with research, and hopefully we are disclosing that and talking about that, we spoke to an outside expert, um, and here's that's how we came to this conclusion. And so this type of transparency around your reporting process, and those were just examples with sourcing, but you can do this with a variety of different things that you do, just why you chose to do the story, how you approach um certain beats like crime, like politics, why you cover certain candidates, why you might be focus focusing on certain issues. This is the 
transparency that's at, a, at the heart of a lot of what we help journalists do that we know can help build trust. We've done some research where news consumers have seen versions of stories that have that explain your process box that, that you just saw that answer those questions, and then they see a version that doesn't. People who saw the version with the explain your process box are more likely to find that the content is trustworthy on multiple different elements of trust. Because when someone says they trust something, it could mean that they think it's fair, that it was unbiased, that it told the whole story. Well, people who saw that explain your process box, they thought that that content was more informative, was more credible, was more fair, was more reliable. And the good news is this also works really well on air. And we've done some research with WCPO, um, a television station in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we did focus groups where we took content that already aired. We added trust language, things explaining like why they withheld an audio recording because of their ethics and to protect privacy, why they were covering a domestic violence issue with a police officer. Um, and we added that language, kind of answering those questions and how it adheres to their ethics and that they're thoughtful and, and, and take care with information. When we showed the two versions of the story, people who, when they saw the version with the trust language added, they liked it better. Um, they said that it was more personal, provided more facts, more context, and they just thought it was generally more complete. What was interesting is they couldn't really pick out like exactly like what was different, which I think is a great sign if you work in TV or radio, because it means it's not interrupting the storytelling, which we worry about all the time it didn't interrupt. They actually preferred the story. Um, and they couldn't tell you what was different, just that it was better for them, more personal, more context. And so one thing, though, that does happen um, when we are talking about specifically political coverage, but happens in a lot of different coverage, but we see it a lot in political coverage, is we sometimes try to get like I don't know, a little cute with a headline, maybe try to have a little fun with a headline specifically adjectives um, can really slip us up when it comes to trying to reach our entire audience. Because um, we will add something like an adjective that's describing something, even like a word just. Oh, this is this house just costs this much money. Well, that could be a lot of money to someone. Maybe that's not a lot of money as you're writing that, but to other people it might, right? And it shows sort of that you're out of touch or you're not like them. So why would I now read this story? Um, and it feeds into other stereotypes as well. So we have found if you want to reach your whole audience with political coverage, but with coverage beyond that, you want to try to um, avoid adjectives that can make it seem um, that the youth that could potentially be problematic and stick to maybe more of that kind of sterile language. Um, and think about the words you're using very carefully. Um, the other thing is to stop over generalizing. Um, when we did research with newsrooms, um, it was research where newsrooms were trying to reach people who uh, lean right or identified more as conservative or Republicans. Um, one of the biggest complaints that we heard from those people is that, you know, they feel like they're all lumped together. What's interesting is this is something that it's not just conservatives that feel this way. You see this when you talk to other groups of people who have been marginalized, covered poorly, not covered in um, areas um, of either communities and just on a national level. But people feel as if you are lumping them into by just saying, oh, it's all of the black, the black voters feel this way, young voters feel this way, the Latino vote, right? The female vote. There are all sorts of ways that we do this. Yes, there's polling that can back some of that up. And if you're going to use polls, make sure to put that in the headline and say this new poll shows Young voters support whoever more than this, the other person. But if you don't have data like that and you just went and talked to a couple people, we really should not be overgeneralizing. The other thing we can do is work to get more specific about how we describe people. So not just saying, oh, this person's pro-choice, this person's pro-life, oh, this person's anti-abortion, pro-abortion, whatever it might be. Most people's views are actually much more complicated. So could you get more specific about how they feel when you are highlighting their voices? And can we highlight more moderate voices, which as journalists, we tend not to do because guess what? It's a lot easier on deadline to get that lawmaker who is always outspoken, that political activist, that community activist, 
that mom who's already angry about what's happening at the school, that who's actually the person who contacted you, right? So like you have those voices, they're easy, they're there. But research has shown a lot of people, their views are not really that extreme. Yet we highlight those extreme voices, sometimes because it's easy. Sometimes it's because we want clicks, which I hope that's not the case for all of you, but that is a reality. But if we could work to instead highlight more of those moderate voices and not just highlight just a soundbite that is just like gonna, honestly, people are going to see and think that's crazy. Like, and, but if people will talk about it, that's not our goal. That shouldn't be our goal. We want to get them to understand what's going on, not have these kind of reactions about it. Um, another really, really important thing is to recognize um, staff blind spots, because when we're talking specifically about what is a moderate voice, what's an extreme voice, um, adjectives, language we use, a lot of that is based on who we are, right, as individuals, but also as journalists and in, in and entire newsrooms. And what we know is that journalists tend to be whiter and more educated and are more likely to live in liberal places than the population overall. Um, and so things that are normal to us may not be normal to our community or the people that we serve, definitely not to everyone. And so thinking about one, recognizing that, two, we can try to work on that by bringing more diversity into the newsroom, which is important, but also thinking about who's in your circle, where are these story ideas coming from? Who are you able to ask questions to in the community about a story to see what am I? Is, is there a voice that's missing? Is this, does this angle make sense? Is there something that we should be including, not including? Those are really important for us to, to think about and ask for ourselves as well, because our impact is really limited if we are seen as part of the polarized society. We are contributing to the polarization by highlighting those extreme voices, that loudest soundbite, um, not sticking to moderate and overgeneralizing basically people's beliefs. It's part of the problem. And it's really not helpful. It's not going to help anyone. It's definitely not going to help people have conversations with one another. It's not going to help us find solutions. And it's not going to help people come to your coverage. And so with all of this, we also want to not forget about that importance of humility um, in just asking questions like that how do we know this? Do we have a good answer for that? Um, and that understanding that we don't automatic and or deserve automatic trust, we need to earn it. And for some reason, I think we, some people in media for a while has thought like, well, of course you trust us. We're producing the news because we do have good intentions. Well, people don't know that. People don't understand that. And we need to work to build that relationship. Because if you think about who you trust, people you know, people probably you've spoken to, or at least you've met in person or you feel like you have because of different uh, online conversations you've had. And so we need to keep that in mind with um, how we're reaching people too. And so we're at time here. We just have a couple of resources we want to share. We have an election trust kit. If you want to dive in deeper to any of these strategies, um, here's a link to that. We have some of this and we dive more into other things you can do and it's not too late to implement some of these strategies either. We have a section about what to do the day of. We also have a weekly newsletter that comes out on Tuesdays. And um, we like to have give an actionable tip once a week to help people um, build trust. And then in addition, we are offering coaching um, to help newsrooms depolarize your election coverage. So if there's an issue that you are working on or a story, um, please fill out that link, that form, and we will get back to you to see how we can help. And this is not the end of our um, election series. We have another one coming up October 3rd, and it's called Avoiding Polarization When Reporting on Hot Button Issues. So we hope you will join us for that. And we still have time if anyone has any questions. I don't see any in the chat, feel free to uh, sign off and we'll hang out for just a minute in case um, questions come up. Feel free to unmute. Thanks everyone for your time.